All right, hello. I did my project on Helmholtz resonance and ocarinas. Well, now I know you're probably wondering, well, Sydney, what the heck are those? Well, even if you didn't, I'm gonna tell you anyway. First off, an ocarina is this thing right here, and it's basically just a little flute composed of a neck, a hollow body with holes in it, and pure awesome. Yeah. And anyway, Helmholtz resonance. Well, resonance by itself is defined as the tendency of a system to oscillate with a greater amplitude at some frequencies than others. And Helmholtz resonance is this air resonance within a cavity, and that resonance relies on the springiness of air. Which I will explain later in greater detail, don't worry. Don't worry, yourself, it's okay. Anyway, examples are hollow guitar bodies, empty bottles, which are very simple resonators, and ocarinas, which are complex and what I focused on for my project. Now, I'll go into a little more detail about this air springiness concept. Let's say you have this little bottle right here, and this little bottle is filled with a whole bunch of air particles. However, what we're going to focus on is this little air lump in the neck of the bottle. Now, whenever you blow into the bottle, the air jet you produce pushes the air lump down, causing the air particles in the cavity to compress a bit. In response, the air particles rarefy and push the lump out of the bottle a little bit. The pressure in the bottle continually tries to regulate itself, but the air jet you produce causes the lump to move like it's a mass on a spring. Hence, that's where we get springiness. Yay! Also, if we analyze this on a pressure versus time graph, this is where our wave ends up coming from. Anywho, now that that's out of the way, let's get quantitative, shall we? Alright, so we're bringing the bottle back again. Heck yeah! Okay, so the neck of the bottle has a certain length we're gonna call L. We also have the area of a cross section in the neck, whether it be a circle, rectangle, whatever, that we'll call A. Finally, we also have the initial air volume in the cavity, big V naught, and the speed of sounding gas, which is little vs. All these variables come together to make the Helmholtz frequency formula, which is <gasps> FH equals Vs over 2 pi multiplied by the square root of A over V naught L. Which is scary! I'm scared! Ah. Once I got over being scared of that, I realized that that formula would work fine for resonators that produce only one frequency, like empty bottles for instance, but not so well for ones that can produce multiple frequencies, such as ocarinas, which leads into what I did. Now, ocarinas are covered in a bunch of holes, mine has 12 for instance, that allow the ocarina to change its frequency and pitch. Each of these holes has a different diameter, and therefore a different area, so I measured all of them, as you can see right here. Once that was out of the way, I tested out the different frequencies that each hole produced, along with a large variety of hole combinations. I graphed those results with the purpose of finding out if the frequency was proportional to the area of holes covered, and it turns out they have a nice linear relationship. From that, I was able to conclude that for every square millimeter covered, 1.88 Hz was lost from the base frequency. And from that, I was able to create the equation FOC equals 1328.13, which is the base frequency, or frequency when no holes are covered, minus 1.88x, whereas x is a millimeter squared. I used that equation to collect this data. The average percent error of these results was 7.758%, but when I included uncertainties, that average was bumped down to 3.844%. Once I got done with all of this, I noticed that each hole had a different depth before reaching the inner cavity, so I decided to see if the volume of the holes covered was also proportional to the frequency. And, as you can see, the answer is yes. From this graph, I was able to conclude that every cubic millimeter caused a loss of 0.563 Hz, which I used to adjust my other formula, with x now measured in cubic millimeters, and this is the data I got from that. The average percent error of this data was 10.081, which is a bit higher than my area results, but with uncertainties it was knocked down to pi. I'm just kidding, it was 3.14% though. Now let's compare. For my area results, my data was a little less accurate, but I did have a smaller realm of uncertainty, whereas my, for my volume results, my data was a little more accurate with a larger realm of uncertainty. Some possible sources of error I could have had during all this were sound interferences while I was taking data, but that could have been taken care of when I moved to a quiet room to take my data after a while, but I think mostly they came from measurements because finding hole depth is really hard without proper equipment. But anyway, that sums up my project, so thanks for watching. Oh wait, 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 wait! Haha. <laughs>